Okay, great to see that some people found the way after yesterday's uh, party here, that early in the morning. Um, I would like to show you a bit about, um, or tell you a bit about ammunition in the sea and how we use uh, open source to get a bit better understanding of the whole, whole topic. Just uh, who are we? We are Egeos GmbH, we are a software development company from Kiel, 20 people around, I think some are even watching the live stream now. And um, yeah, I would like to tell you about ammunition. Who actually knows that there is ammunition in the sea here in the room? Okay, some of you have heard about it. That's already already good. So in general, it's like it's like this. So our um, seas and oceans they are substantially really polluted by conventional and chemical ammunition, which happened really um, via different pathways. There is, for example, the pathway of mine laying. Um, Baltic Sea has 300,000 mines during the Second World War. Um, there are naval battles, aerial bombings, military practicing, and yeah, shipwrecks. But However, the biggest amount of ammunition comes from dumping after the Second World War. So really, ammunition is, mainly from the Second World War, is, an ammunition, is a problem of, of our present, not of the past. So how did it look in the past? This is an example of how ammunition was um, put onto ships and really scuttled really in huge, large amounts, and they dumped it into the, into the ocean. I think it's quite quite impressive to see to see this. How does it look uh, underwater today? So um, I hope you can see it. That's an image uh, from a video that shows um, how ammunition really looks like. You can nicely see how it is, um, and you can see here it's actually looking quite well. So it's not too heavily corroded. And that's a picture from the Skagarak. And here what you can see is a ship and in the high resolution image in the side scan sonar, you can really see all these different kinds of ammunition that are really scuttled really or all over the, over the area there. So as you can see, there is quite something going on underwater. And this is also a nice example. That's really a TNT lamp that uh, is in the Baltic Sea. And we can see it's really open lying TNT that is uh, giving its chemicals into, into the water column. So what's the status of uh, the ammunition? Ammunition can look like this. This is uh, a floating mine, or uh, yeah, a mine, that has a very, very thin uh, shell, which is heavily corroded, and uh, the chemicals can easily um, get out of, of the shell. Another example, that's actually a British uh, ground mine, what you can, can see here, and the shells are way thicker. And actually looks quite well when you, when you see it like this on, this on this picture. What are the major threats that are coming from ammunition? I think this one is quite, is quite obvious. Yeah? So this was uh, a tanker which really hooked a torpedo. And then they figured out it was some kind of practicing torpedo, so it was not um, that dangerous anymore, but you can see what this kind of security threats this um, ammunition can, can cause. But even the way bigger threat that we are facing and that we will face in the future even more is the environmental and human impact that will result from the ammunition. There were two studies um, carried out. Um, one study was about um, muscles and the uptake of TNT inside of muscles. Muscles are filtering lots of water and there was a big uptake of TNT and they could really show that close to the ammunition, the muscles are heavily contaminated with TNT compounds. And another frightening example, example actually, there was flatfish. They collected flatfish and in an area where munition dumping happened, 25% of this flatfish, they had liver cancer and was induced by ammunition. In another area, which they used for comparison, there was just 5% of liver cancer in flatfish. So there is really a physical impact. And in the end, it lands on our table. Well, that's, that's clear. For sure, what's about space? What's the spatial uh, distribution um, of the ammunition? So as you can see, it's for sure we have some hotspots in Europe, um, but it's not just related to Europe. We have dumpings in the United States which happened even longer time after the war. We have um, problems in, in Australia, we have problems in Japan, and even in the Mediterranean. So I think it's a worldwide problem that we, that we are facing there. What about the amount? I would like to give you a small example um, what the amounts are, because it's hard to imagine when we talk about ammunition and sea, it's underwater, you just don't, don't see it. Yeah? It would lie just in front of you, you would directly get an understanding. 
Um, just for Germany. Um, it can be assumed out of historic documents and information that we are talking in Germany about 1.6 million tons, German waters. 300,000 tons in the Baltic, 1.3 million in the North Sea. But what does this mean? It's a quite abstract number. It's a freight train with a length of about 3,000 kilometers loaded full of ammunition. Distance actually from Barcelona till Riga. And this is just located in our German waters here. So it's really, really large amounts that we are talking, talking actually about. Yeah, and the good question, how can open source actually help us with this, with this topic? Um, there are so many nice technologies available that open source provides us. And especially with the FOSS4G components like GeoServer, OpenLayer, PostgreSQL, it allows us to get a more systematic understanding of, of the problem. And I would like to show you how we realized this in one of our applications. So how does such a system look like comprised of these technologies? So this is the ammunition cadaster C. You can actually go even to the website amucat.org and it has a public interface where you can see um, the official munition dumping information that is published in reports, that is published via Halcom, Baltic Sea and other institutions. There are different kinds of, of topics that you can have a look, but also for sure there's a subscription model where you can log in and get some more information actually. So I would like to show you some of the data sets which are actually quite uh, impressive. So one data set we collected um, are, for example, mines. So this is, um, these are mines um, from gardening, so-called gardening. So they planted these mines with airplanes. So, and what you can see here, that's actually where we are located, in Kiel. And this is the Kiel Canal. That's one of the most used water streets in, in the world. And just last year, they removed roughly 200 mines from this place, so where the ships directly go, go over. And it's quite impressive when you map this, actually, what you can, can get out of it. Another interesting data set um, we got from a historic document, actually, uh, which we found in one of the archives. <coughs> It's so-called constraint routes. Yeah, this is information about um, which routes the Germans tried to keep free of ammunition because they needed some shipping lines. And we mapped this onto the document uh, and showed that there is some quite interesting correlation I will show you in the next slide. Um, this is another interesting uh, data set. It's the so-called Marine Quadratkarte. So the Germans, for giving uh, quite fast information about the location, they didn't use coordinates directly, they used squares. They put the whole world into squares, six times six um, uh, miles each square, and then you can just give a coordinate via <coughs> AN6412, and you know directly where you, where you are. They use uh, some kind of code. We have infrastructure, for example. Infrastructure is quite interesting uh, because if you want to build something there, out offshore, where there is lots of ammunition, you have to deal with this topic of ammunition. A nice example is actually here. There's a wind park uh, in Germany called Rifgat. And uh, due to ammunition clearance, the project got 100 million euros more expensive because they erected the wind turbines, they were standing there, but the cable took too long because they had to clear so much ammunition and they had to manually rotate the wind turbines to keep them alive. Well, it's crazy. Uh, relevant data sets, but we're not talking just about actual data sets, we're also talking about historical data sets. I'll come to this uh, in a minute. There are different levels of access, so there's public and private access, um, and we have tools and apps in there. One of the tools, for example, uh, we developed is some kind of a spatial search, you, so you can actually spatially search for maps and also events, historic events that happened in a place. It's quite important to know when you want to make some kind of desk study. But we also have applications, I will also talk uh, um, in some further slides about, about them. Also, we have modules. For example, there is an ammunition module. Um, we have an ammunition database in there because we want to exactly know which kind of ammunition with which kind uh, of parameters we are talking about. Therefore, we also have a chemicals database. So the ammunition is um, made out of different kind of chemicals. So we want to, in the end, be able to calculate really the environmental impact at some, some point. Let's come to the historic data, which is actually quite, quite interesting and quite valuable for this whole topic of ammunition in the, in the sea. 
We're talking there about really different kinds of documents, reports, and maps. You can see some different ones. You can see uh, some documents that really have coordinates. For us, great finding if we have some precise coordinates. This one I was talking earlier about, it's this Marine Quadrat Karte, actually squares all over the world. Also, we have the information, it's good. Um, but then sometimes we have also some really abstract information, so three miles in the northeast of this kind of island, so really abstract, which is then even harder to bring onto, onto a map. We made, for example, a maps uh, overview, and um, we made our own tool for georeferencing the maps in the browser and actually attaching this um, ammunition information to these data sets, which you can see here. So each circle is uh, one kind of ammunition here, in this case, a British Mark IV mine. Now this is then how it looks like when you map this stuff. So these are just uh, some uh, mines in the front of the Netherlands and the German uh, North Sea coast. And you can see there's quite interesting correlation again between um, these constraint routes and this and these mines. But the most impressive one is this, I think. Um, here we found a really nice uh, correlation. So what I showed earlier, these are these constraint routes. Yeah? So these routes which are kept free from ammunition during the Second World War. So they were secret. German. So, but when you now put the other information, the document that we found in the UK, on top of this, you can directly see they were not that secret anymore. Because <laughs> you can see a really nice correlation, but you can see this only when you put it to some kind of map. That's why spatial information is so, so important for us, not just only in this context. So um, we also want to import different kinds of data set to make some more different understanding of the whole stuff. So one example is, for example, a side scan sonar data set. We saw this data before, so we can import raster data sets to put them onto the map and to visualize them with other vector information. That's quite simple. Uh, another interesting example I have here, why it really makes sense to overlay these data sets and to get some more information out of it. So there was the MSC Zoe in uh, January 2019. Maybe some of you have heard about uh, her. It was a container ship that lost quite some uh, cargo in the North Sea. So I, I think about 400 containers. So and I talked to some person at another conference and he said to me, yeah, we were the responsible company for actually getting up the, the containers uh, again. And they were fishing and fishing, and at some point they got up a container with two mines inside the net that they were using. And he said, oh, if we would have known this before, we would have for sure had to definitely, definitely different approach. Yeah? And the interesting thing is when you overlay exactly this route of this MSC Zoe where it was going, you can see really, again, nice correlations. So they directly lost the, their cargo more in a minefield, in a historic minefield. So, that's why it's quite, quite valuable to have this kind of information as well. I want to tell you a bit about uh, research projects. So um, this is our project, but we are integrating different European research projects. We are also partner of different European research projects um, that we are integrating into the application. And that's how we do it. So we um, decided that we want to bring this research into some kind of productive uh, system and not lose it somewhere. Um, and the idea is that um, we are really providing the interfaces for this different kind of European research uh, projects, and I will show you some, some of them. So one is the so-called Norsi Rex. So the idea is, it just started one year ago, um, that we want to have a precise mapping of shipwrecks over the whole uh, North Sea. Um, and in the end, also some kind of statistical assessment. And most of the wrecks um, are from the Second World War, which are in the North Sea, actually. And also to develop monitoring strategies, so-called uh, interreg North Sea Rec, um, project. We have partners from Belgium, Denmark, Norway, and Netherlands in, in this project. UK was a bit difficult to get in, because you know the political reasons. Um, but we also were talking to, to you guys. Um, Another project uh, that actually just got the uh, follow-up project is uh, Damon, so the so-called decision aid for marine munitions. So the first three years were done, and the idea is there to analyze this uh, large amounts of sediments, fish information, to develop some kind of toolboxes for analyzing and monitoring, and to provide to the uh, stakeholders, to the administration, some kind of decision support with the help of artificial intelligence. And I would like to show you how this at the moment looks like. Partners here, other side of Schleswig-Holstein, of Germany, is the Baltic Sea region. So we have partners from Poland, Sweden, Lithuania, uh, Norway, and uh, Finland involved in this project. 
And the first step was in this project to acquire lots of data. So they analyzed over a course of several years about 30,000 fishes, for example, and tried to find um, information um, about uptake of uh, ammunition in some way. They also uh, analyzed lots of sediments, especially in dumping sites, to get an understanding how um, compounds of ammunition are penetrating actually the, the ground. And also quite some, some water samples. And that's an ongoing approach. More and more data is, is coming. And we provide then in the end some, some interface that collects uh, all this information that uh, actually queries different um, APIs to provide you a specific point, the most information that you can, can get for the later uh, analytics. So what you do, actually, you just uh, place your marker here. You say, OK, we have a different kind. Uh, we have some kind of ammunition type in here. Um, we give some information about the corrosion, the sediments, um, and the uh, biomass, if there is something on top. So we place an object. And then we are querying really different kinds of APIs, for example, Helcom, about the status of biodiversity at this point. Um, we are getting information about uh, fishery, what's the intensity of fishery at this place. We are getting information about physical properties, what's just simply the depth or the slope and all this kind of stuff. Um, and for sure also about uh, marine traffic. Marine traffic is also important if it comes to safety uh, things. And then you get actually some kind of um, risk analysis. So we say we have different kind of protection goods. We want to know, for example, for fishery at this specific point, what does this object could cause? Yeah, we have a high intensity of fishery at this point. We have a mine which is in quite good conditions. And we have trawling nets going over this mine. This can't be good. Well, they, I don't even need an artificial intelligence to, to tell you this. Um, but we have different kinds of, of uh, information involved. And in the end, for the, for the administration and also for the infrastructure providers, we provide some full report actually about um, the place with the information about risks for different kinds of uh, objects. Um, about what the object is about, the regional parameters we call them, about marine traffic, for example. Um, and also we use OpenStreetMap data, infrastructure. So in case there could be an explosion, which kind of infrastructure could be actually affected by, by this? And there's one other research project which we just uh, got the uh, funding. Uh, that's quite nice and interesting thing that we will uh, start um, from the uh, beginning of 2020. It's so-called uh, BASTA. Um, the idea is to um, equip this guy, so an autonomous uh, underwater vehicle, with the historical data from our system and then send it to the areas where we expect lots of historic uh, ammunition findings. And this guy then has different kinds of sensors and uses uh, different kinds of sensors to detect and classify based on artificial intelligence uh, later the uh, ammunition types and provides us hopefully way more information about the amount of ammunition, the spatial uh, distribution of ammunition. And we have some interesting partners from Belgium and um, from Germany, some research agencies uh, and also some uh, mapping agencies uh, involved. And all this information will again then go into, into our system. So, and that's actually it. Happy to take questions, actually. Yeah. Do you have information about uh, uh, dumping of uh, ammunition in lakes in Europe? Um, this system mostly focuses uh, on ocean uh, dumpings, um, but uh, in general there is also information about, about lakes, because lakes, in the end, it's also quite heavily polluted. Yeah? There is also quite big threat coming from, from lakes, which is in the first beginning not so obvious. But there is for sure lots of stuff, uh, information available. Um, but our main focus at the moment is here really based on, on the ocean. But in the end, the same information is also about lakes available, yeah. Yeah. How easy to trigger this animation? To take out. Uh, about triggering, okay, the question is about uh, how easy it is to trigger this ammunition to explode. Um, there were some studies uh, carried out by the German Fraunhofer Institute. The interesting thing is the ammunition gets really more sensitive over time, so it gets easier. Definition of easy is a bit uh, difficult in this, in this context, so you could actually start some kind of ammunition with a heavy hit of an anchor. That is theoretically possible, but it doesn't have to happen. Yeah, it's also depending on the state of the ammunition. Just one, maybe one interesting fact about um, this uh, state of the ammunition. Uh, so um, ammunition they can lie in the same type of ammunition can lie in the same spot. 
and they can look completely different. One looks almost like new and one almost looks completely uh, corroded. Depends on so many factors that we don't even know about the corrosion in the, in the sea and also about the steel quality, for example. Uh, the Germans, at the end of the war, the steel quality was just bad. Yeah, and this, especially this ones, they corrode even, even heavier. And one of the research projects I mentioned, um, there were also some corrosion measurements are, are carried out. But corrosion underwater is extremely uh, complex. So there is no really clear answer, answer to this. But, but in general, TNT gets more sensitive over time underwater. That's one of the findings of this research. Really good question. We have this discussion all the time when we have a military and a scientific group next to each other. Yeah? Because the military guys say, blow it up, yeah, then it's gone. Yeah? And the scientists say, what are you talking about actually, guys? You have no idea. You are spreading way, way more. And um, there were measurements taken with these muscles. So they placed the muscles directly at some bombs which were non-exploded and at some kind of explosion holes where they put them. And the uptake of the muscles at these exploded bomb sites was 10 times higher. So, as a clear indicator, when you actually explode the bomb, that is not an answer to anything. Yeah? So you can't just say and explode everything. The environmental impact is so much more. And also the impact of, uh, of sounding onto the environment, uh, like whales. That is, it's not an option, actually, to do this. Yeah, there is quite some aerial photography available from, from this time, that's, that's true. Um, we have some available if we um, need information, for example, about ships in harbors. Because sometimes these uh, historical images, um, I don't know if you know this, but there were um, historical images taken with really high detail during this time. You can really see specific ships and specific areas really, really well. And sometimes these aerial images help really in determining which type of ship it was. And then when you find the historic documents that states, okay, this ship was there with this kind of ammunition load, it's a very important information that we can, can get. But for sure, on the open sea, it only helps if there was some kind of battle. Yeah? But in the end, it's a really valuable information, definitely. Yeah. Just another question. Yeah. Did, you, did you find an algorithm to rectify these photographs? Or are you just looking at them and just like, uh, do you be the thumb? <laughs> Yeah, you, you, um, there is no automatic way of uh, this automatic rectification of this kind of images. They are too complex, too heterogeneous. Yeah? So there were lots of people who already tried this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is really no, no chance to do this. So there is lots of manual work. This data is just so heterogeneous. The quality is so heterogeneous. You will get hardly good results in some kind of automatic way of this rectification of these images. Other questions? Okay, then thank you very much.